prophecy of Micah speaks of a drunkenness which shall occur among those people who should have found rest in the sanctification of Christ. The Hebrew word translated rest in Micah's prophecy commonly appears in Old Testament scripture where the context points to the rest of God that is promised to his elect. This promise, so central to the gospel, according to Micah's prophecy, is somehow removed from the reach of those who are told that they must depart, for this is not their rest. And there are ministers who have polluted their ministries with lies and with false teaching. The Hebrew word translated polluted is the most common word translated defiled in the King James Version. The Hebrew word translated prophecy is normally translated drop in the context of the dripping of a liquid. However, we find that a more in-depth study of the word extends its meaning to the prophetic word. The prophets are said to drop their word upon the land. The Hebrew word translated prophet is not the common word for prophet in the King James. The word literally means to drip and is a common metaphor for the dripping of a liquid. As a prophet is said to drop the words of God on a land, he might be considered to be a dripper of God's word, which is how the phrase literally reads. That is, he shall be the dripper, that is, of prophecy for this people. During the early 1990s, within the Word of Faith movement and Kenneth Hagin's REMA organization, there arose a truly phenomenal ministry of signs and wonders. The ministry of Rodney Howard Brown was unlike any in recorded history. Characterized by overt supernatural phenomenon, the Howard Brown ministry added the sign of uncontrolled laughter to those traditionally charismatic signs of shaking and falling under the power. As well, Rodney Howard Brown's account of how he received this anointing must be considered one of the most peculiar testimonies of all time. The event occurred in 1979 in his native South Africa, just after he turned 18 years of age. The young Rodney was crying out to God to manifest himself. He writes that upon God telling him that he must first hunger and thirst, his response to God was that God should just give it to him as he deserved it. The manner in which Howard Brown received his anointing seems to have carried into his teaching, which encouraged men to place a demand upon the anointing. Certainly, to a certain extent, he was primed for a theology of demanding power from God, given his positive confession word of faith roots in Kenneth Hagin's Rhema organization. Howard Brown's added contribution to positive confession theology was to remove it from a Pentecostal framework entirely so as to constitute a rejection of the classical Pentecostal teaching that we are to ask and tarry and petition God for the baptism of his spirit. The following video is helpful for doctrinal context to Howard Brown's ministry and begins with a message from a female pastor by the name of Marion Mears. The message constitutes a repudiation of classical Pentecostal doctrine in several respects. You know, you can laugh just like you can speak in tongues. If I told every one of you right now to speak in tongues that's baptized in the Holy Spirit, you could do it. You don't have to wait for an anointing. And then the anointing hooks up with you. You start out in the flesh, but then he hooks up with you in the spirit. It's the same with the laughter. And so I began to laugh. I wasn't anointed of God. But I said, in my spirit, I was saying, Jesus, this is a drink for you. And I began to laugh. <laughs> Jesus, this is for you. <laughs> and you know, he hooks up with you. If you'll just give him a drink first, he'll hook up with you. The Holy Ghost is going to come alongside of you. He's going to hook up with you, and you're going to end up in the Spirit of God. Life! 
We'll go ahead and just take a drink now. The bar's open. Go ahead and take a drink. Go ahead, just take a drink. Just start off in the natural. You'll end up in the Holy Ghost. Just start off in the natural. Just start off. Ha, 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 ha. Just start off in the natural. You'll end up in the Holy Ghost. Just start off in the natural. You'll end up over in the realm of the glory. <laughs> Mears declares that anyone baptized in the Holy Spirit can speak in tongues at will. Well, this is incorrect. Because while the Pentecostal teaching affirms tongues as constituting the sign of spirit baptism, it does not necessarily bring the gift. The Apostle Paul clearly indicates that not all are gifted with tongues, although belonging to the church. While on the subject of tongues, Miss Mears states, quote, it's the same with the laughter, close quote. Her meaning is that just as we sometimes begin in the flesh and the Holy Spirit meets us when operating in the gift of tongues, so we may do the same to move in this special anointed laughter. Well, aside from the fact that she is now asserting a teaching, which is entirely extra-biblical, her analogy is rendered moot by the fact that Mr. Howard Brown's manifestations seem to affect all men, not just those who have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. In fact, there does not even appear to be a clearly articulated requirement that one even believe the gospel in order to receive what the whole auditorium appears to be receiving. of strong drink is found first in the Mosaic Law's prohibitions on drinking alcohol under circumstances that would conflict with one's spiritual duties, beginning with the admonition to Aaron, the high priest of Israel. Do not drink wine or strong drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. We are also told that in the wilderness the children of Israel drank no alcohol, and this fact is related to their coming into the knowledge of God. We read, You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that you might know that I am the Lord your God. And that is not to say that alcohol was forbidden by the law. It was not. Otherwise, it would have been used, not been used by the Hebrews throughout their history. In fact, there was even a Mosaic offering which required the use of strong drink as a libation. We read, And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of a hen for the one lamb. In the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. Curiously, the most notable reference to strong drink in the law was in the context of the annual return of the tithe to the Lord. We read, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field brings forth by year by year, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God. In the place he shall choose to place his name there the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and thy flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord thy God always. The stated reason for the return of the tithe annually is curious, that is, that you may learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Therefore an association is stated between the return of the tithe, a principle akin to repentance, and abiding in the fear of the Lord, a principle akin to our sanctification in Christ. And this is an important principle and association to bear in mind. Reading further, And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to sit his name there, when the Lord thy God has blessed thee. And therefore what is presented in this instruction by Moses is essentially an alternative or option to repentance. That, that is, if you cannot return the tenth, that is a symbol for repentance is the true work of the Spirit, then there is only one option for the ineffectuality of grace. And so Moses continues, Then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desires, Thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. 
strong drink, therefore, can stand as a substitute for something. What God required of the man, the man was not able to bring. But what did God require? Well, that thing for which he imparted to us his spirit. God wanted repentance, and he wanted its good fruit. For with repentance, God may deliver the soul from its bondages to the world, to sin, to material things, to improper desire and selfish ambition. And this is the principle of the tithe, that is God's return on investment through the person and work of his Son, Jesus Christ. But what if the man is unable to keep this appointment so as to come into the knowledge of the truth? Well, he is given strong drink. Give strong drink unto them that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let them forget their true end by means of a deceived heart. Let them commence upon a vicious cycle of self-deception, wherein sin begets darkness, and darkness begets more sin. And this is a truly insidious condition, and therefore we are urged to exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For sin itself is an intoxicating agent. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And therefore we learn from the Proverbs two things about strong drink. Number one, strong drink is for the perishing. Secondly, strong drink is a mocker. Paul writes, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Well, why do they receive not the love of the truth? Well, because they regard the truth as foolishness. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. And therefore there is a danger in strong drink, and that danger is mocking in a day of judgment. And what characterizes the perishing? Well, despising at a time they should be repenting. And therefore Paul warned the Jews at Pisidian Antioch that by rejecting the witness of the Holy Ghost, they brought upon themselves the prophetic judgment of perdition. And behold, you despisers, and wonder, and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And what was the sign of their perishing in their own corruption? Well, sinning with their mouth against the Spirit's work. And as it turned out, the Jews did, in fact, reject the preaching of the cross. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spoke against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. The speaking against Christ is itself a sign. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set forth for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which it shall be spoken against. The mocking of the sacrifice of the Son of God is the sign of perdition, the evidence that one is perishing in his own corruption. And therefore we have the prophecy, They that sit in the gate speak against me. And I was the song of the drunkards. Spiritual drunkenness is to reject or to lack due regard for truth at the time and place that God's Spirit is calling men into salvation and to repentance. And for these, God gives them over to delusion and to an intensification of sin's bondage. Lacking the receiving of the truth as to themselves, they are directed into their own lusts. And so we read further, And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desires. Strong drink, therefore, intensifies men's bondage to the things of this world. It causes men to descend into a depth of sin intensified by their lack of repentance the effect of failing to perceive one's own day of salvation is itself spiritually intoxicating. And so as to this, Paul writes, So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober, for those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. 
But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. To be spiritually sober is to be cognizable of our need for the atoning sacrifice of Christ, and to be attending upon His Word and His Spirit. Certainly, this may only be applied in a spiritual sense. This same prophet, Isaiah, applies the analogy of drunkenness in chapter 56 to being spiritually unprepared. And likewise, the Lord conveys to us the same when he says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unaware. That the Lord uses the concept of drunkenness metaphorically seems apparent from statements made by the apostles. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul's context is the sudden destruction that shall come near the final days. He writes, Therefore let us not sleep, as others do, but let us be sober, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken, are drunken in the night. And Paul's statements are obviously of the same figurative language used by Christ when describing the spiritually unaware. Sleep alludes to a condition of being unaware of what is happening around you. The carnal man is asleep regarding spiritual matters. Drunkenness alludes to the frivolity and recklessness of sinners concerning spiritual things. As a son of Joseph, and so of Israel, Ephraim fits allegorically into the church and stands as a warning for Christians. And the drunkenness of Ephraim is well attested to in the prophets. Peter writes, Therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. The association is clear between spiritual insobriety and between such things as lust, disobedience, and unholiness. The prophets make numerous references to strong drink. And is it alcohol that they are referring to? Or is it rather a spiritual meaning which is intended? The first mention of alcohol in scripture does not occur in an especially positive context. We read that after planting a vineyard, Noah made the mistake of drinking to excess. We read, And he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And thus in the first instance of drinking wine in scripture, an association is established between drunkenness and nakedness. And we might next inquire whether this association is repeated, and we find that the prophets do support this association. Lamentations 4.21 Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwells in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken, and shalt make thyself naked. Habakkuk 2.15 Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Well, what is the reason for this association between drunkenness and nakedness. We might begin by appreciating the fact that both principles are spiritual, and the gospel relates to a spiritual drunkenness and a spiritual nakedness. And according to the prophets, these two bear close association. Isaiah prophesies, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them, and the harp, and the vial, and the tabard, and the pipe, and and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operations of his hands. The work of the Lord is our sanctification. Jesus said, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Rising up early is something of a theme in prophecy, given its repetitious use, particularly in the prophecies of Jeremiah, wherein the Lord refers to his rising early for the cause of converting 
the recalcitrant heart. And this signifies the new day as a peculiar time for God to speak to the heart. And he does so through the means of his grace, his goodness, as Paul writes also concerning the unrepentant to whom God speaks. And Paul writes, Or despisest thou the riches and goodness and forbearance and long suffering that is of God, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? And therefore, what is it that rises up early to speak to men? Well, the goodness and grace of God. And therefore, after judgment is poured out, the prophet nevertheless expresses hope in God's mercy. Jeremiah writes, Remembering mine affliction and mine misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul has them still in remembrance and is humble in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. Therefore, what does the morning signify in the gospel? Well, this is the time to awaken, not a time for drinking. In fact, we read, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. The morning is a time for awakening unto righteousness and to behold the God who manifests himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But while some will use the morning advent of the witness of Christ to awaken to righteousness, others will use the same special season of God's grace to transgress against his mercy through drunkenness. They sin away their day of grace, and then comes the night. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. So what is spiritual drunkenness? To receive spiritual things while lacking a due regard for Christ's truth. And the result is clear from the prophets. Spiritual drunkenness results in an intensification of sin's bondage. who should have entered into God's rest are turned away. Well, through the pollution of the prophetic gifts and ministries, through false teaching leading to idolatry. And the Bible tells us plainly that desire for the material constitutes idolatry. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And if we are commanded to flee idolatry, then we are therefore commanded to flee covetous desire. That is the desire for attainment in this world, the desire for material things and worldly advancement. The Lord tells us plainly that his kingdom is not to be divided between these two things. He says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The word of faith, prosperity, and moder the modern prophetic movements have attempted just that through their teachings. They have directed the eyes of the church upon the things of this world rather than upon the things of heaven. But listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. If ye then be risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. False teachers will direct the affections of men into the things of the earth, into material things and natural concerns. And by so doing, they prevent the church from attaining that true blessing of God, which God would have given them and to rather place their hopes in something else. Through Christ, we receive God's life given to men. 
But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God would sanctify them through this hope. And therefore, it is not without reason that Paul urges us to seek those things which are above. God will give us that which is eternal, but only if that is where our desire lies. If our affections are in this world, we cannot be fed with the divine life of God. And if our hope is in the material, our confidence is in the flesh. We pursue a false god, a corruption of wisdom, an idol. Rather than receiving sanctification from heaven into the likeness of Christ, we receive just the opposite, the imprint of the God of this world. In this way, the church has been corrupted and does not find sanctification. We find that many of the most brazenly false teachers are equipped with powerful manifestations in their meetings. And indeed, power from heaven is what their listeners will need if they are to overcome the satanic counsel that they are given from the pulpit. And here is an example of what is heard from many anointed pulpits. And God has used her very powerfully all over the world. And you need to hear what just happened in her life these last few years. And I trusted the man of God when he said to me, yes. God wants to release your inheritance. I try to leave poor here and I got to get out of here. He said, don't you leave here because your inheritance is right here. Yes. And I obeyed. Didn't want to, but I obeyed. And uh, we found out that they owed us money. And when they called the government, India, the government called us and told us that they owed us $80 million. Come on, people. You ain't saying nothing. Yes. Five thousand dollars, and I didn't have it to sow. You didn't have it to sow. I didn't. And I, I told her, I, I I, you didn't. know, I've for years, I, I've said, mm -hmm. when the Lord Jesus appeared to me in 1997, He gave me the keys of the kingdom that He gave Peter. Right. And He says, I not only gave you these keys to loose moves of God over regions, but to loose money. I'm gonna let y'all hear another testimony. Another one of my sons here just came into thirty million. Sure did. His business. <laughs> only was bringing in 135,000 but when the keys were loosed on him he came into 30 million she came into 80 million yeah. the man down in Taylor got 1 billion in one day I'm telling you it's for real y'all listen go on it's yes. for real it, this is real I mean you know I'm not uh, I'm you know I'm not somebody to just you know accept everything I hear and I'm you know I'm, I'm you know I'm not I'm not a novice I've been in ministry for many, 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 many years. And so I'm just not a flake brain. Somebody just accept whatever. But I'm telling you, when I obey the man of God, I'm telling you, God came through. And we're about to receive. I mean, I won't have to ever want again for anything. Yes. My People, husband took come on, give very God the well. It's uh, amazing. But the reason why I have you get up here is because... Some people don't understand what a face-to-face -face prophet is. A prophet, there are many different levels of prophets, but the Bible speak of the highest one are those who talk with God face-to-face. -face. And that's very rare. And I'm called to be that type of prophet. I'm really being humble about this. But when you, when you obey a command from someone who talks to God face-to-face, -face, this is the type of release that comes to you. How many of you believe that? Multiply millions. We're not talking about just a few hundred thousand dollars we're talking about millions when the man of god tells you that god wants to loose and when he loose those keys on you believe me when i tell you if he tell you i'm releasing the keys on you for wealth you can put your foot on it wealth is coming yes. it's coming i'm telling you amen it's coming. hallelujah god this corrupted it. principle of sowing in order to reap financial reward finds its origins in the positive confession teachings of ew kenyon in the early 20th century Kenyon taught almost exclusively on the principle of faith as an assertive principle which may be wielded by the believer to make a change in the material. One of the best known devotees of Kenyon's teachings was the Pentecostal minister Kenneth Hagin. Hagin picked up Ken Kenyon's teachings near the time of the Latter Rain Revival of the late 1940s and he promoted 
positive confession theology in the Pentecostal churches throughout the 1950s and 1960s. Hagen particularly focused upon faith as a means of reaping in the material. And Hagen founded a movement which became known as the Faith Message, also known as the Prosperity Gospel, so called. His organization, Rama, became virtually synonymous with the Prosperity Message beginning in the 1970s. The modern day phenomenon of uproarious laughter appears to have originated within Hagen's Rama organization and was spread most effectively by one of his ministers, Rodney Howard Brown. Kenneth Hagen's allusions to sending angels out for money might be credited with the modern day heresy of commanding angels for the accumulation of wealth. And I said, I claim $150 this week. I'm just going to be there one week. <laughs> Satan, take your hand off my money. <laughs> Go ministering spirits and cause the money to come. Went on back over the house, laid down, took me out. That, that said it. I don't, he said, don't pray, so I don't pray. Oh. You spoke it. Didn't I, you? I've never, I've never, for me personally, I've never prayed about finances in a game. Go ministering spirits and cause the money to come. With its focus upon physical health and material prosperity, Hagen's Word of Faith movement became known as the Prosperity Message. And as Hagen arose within the Pentecostal Church, his message represented a strong source of stumbling within the community of the Spirit baptized. One of the most well known and most blatant champions of the prosperity teaching was Kenneth Copeland. In this recent video, Copeland speaks of his own material wealth as if his money itself constituted the kingdom of God. He said three billionaires. Now, I don't, I don't want you to get disturbed because uh, since I'm one of them, it'll only leave two more. <laughs> no, now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute, of course, I'm saying this with a smile on my face, but I'm serious as I can be. But now, I'm not one of those three since I already am one. <laughs> I've already appropriated that. I've been walking in that a long time. Amen. That I want you to begin to confess the billion flow. Because as long as you were in the million flow, you were winning millions. You go into the billion flow, you win billions. We love all that the ministry has done all over the world. And every time we see Rhema students and they run up to us and they say, Hey, we went to Rhema, we went to Rhema. And we can say, Praise the Lord. You know, we're partners with Brother Hagin. I'm partners with Kenneth Hagin. Yeah, amen. I'm a partner with Brother Hagin, Kenneth Hagin's ministry. I am thrilled with it. I am proud. Of it. Well, I greet you, Brother Hagin and Aretha. We're so glad to be a part of this wonderful time but, in your life. Uh, you prophesied over me, and you said if you will be willing and obedient, you'll eat you the fat of the land. And I knew as a uh, prophet of God, a man who uh, loves God with all of his heart. You know, Brother Hagin, I want to say that your ministry has really been the one ministry that really has changed my life. When we first met, when it was 1959 in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California, at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Meeting, an international meeting, and that's the first time I ever saw you. I didn't realize that you would be used of God to change my life. I was a Baptist preacher filled with the Holy Ghost. I was just going all over the country, uh, giving my testimony. That's about all I knew. I was saved, and I had the baptism in the Holy Ghost. But then you came into Houston, and you began to teach the Word of God and the Word of Faith. The Word of God began to take hold in my heart. I was fascinated. I was thrilled. You know, I was intrigued. I, co I couldn't stay out of those meetings. And you can remember how I stayed with you all the many weeks many you were here, years that you came back and forth. We were in that little church. But it was your message that changed my life, that gave me the faith to build this great church yes. and to reach out into over 100 nations of the world. I would never have done it if I had not known what you taught. And I want to give you the honor yes. and the credit and thank you for those years and the many things that you taught me. And uh, I have received them and put them into practice. 
Hello, I'm Leroy Thompson, pastor of the Word of Life Christian Center in Darrell, Louisiana. It affords me a great pleasure to uh, speak these words of encouragement to Dad. Uh, Brother Hagen, it's, it's, it's a blessing. I want to catch a hold to of what you're putting out. Thank you so much for being a spiritual father to me and to our ministry. We Your love you. We are ministry have had a profound influence on Oral Roberts' life and on my family, what you have meant to my son. The draw of these false teachers is that power and a dynamic anointing appears to be a common aspect of their meetings. Their listeners precariously straddle between two views, whether to serve Christ or whether to serve the god Mammon, and certainly they cannot do both. You adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And this would appear to be the dynamic at work in the worldly Christ-professing church, which straddles peculiarly atop the wall between light and darkness, between truth and the world. And Satan works to transform himself into an angel of light, that he may wrench truth out of the hand of its possessor, that he may turn a half-truth into a lie, a lie into a heresy, and a heresy into apostasy. And therefore there is an urgency to the Spirit's call that we come out of Babylon before her judgment strikes. And if their day of salvation is still available to them, then God will give more grace. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? but he gives more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. What shall we say then of those ministers who teach that the sign of God's blessing is the accumulation of material wealth? They flaunt the payment they receive for their service to the God Mammon, their reward as prophets of Mammon. We are warned of those who run greedily after the error of Balaam, but we are told upon such as these, God shall deliver them up to strong delusion. They were drunk. They were acting like drunks. false teachers who work to direct the church to themselves and to the mean things of the material world shall become drippers of strong drink, deluding the slumbering church who cannot see its own complicity in the world's regress into ever more direct demonic inspiration and agency. An apostate church, so long as it resists the testimony of Christ, shall give away its strength to spoil and empower carnality in the hearts of the heathen, leading to the final apostasy. James, 
there is tremendous hope which awaits those adulterers and adulteresses to the world's spirit on the day when they truly hear God's voice and turn from their wicked ways. And so James continues, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Only the repentance of the church shall put off the closing of the door of salvation and the final apostasy. Prophecy tells us that the church shall run the peril of delusion by her own false teachers and false prophets who prophesy by the spirit of falsehood. Jeremiah prophesies, For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. As the days became more perilous, some of these teachers will openly and clearly be displayed as false. Take, for example, the self-proclaimed apostle David Taylor. Something is happening all over this place. These years, fire goes to ready. I command you. Mammon is leaving you. God had me call that out. He, he, James. <laughs>this 2014 Super Bowl, February the 2nd. Now, the reason why I come to you on this camera is because I like to tell you about events before they take so place. So one of the future forecasts in the next few days is that the Broncos are gonna win this Super Bowl that is about to take place against the Seattle Hawks. And I understand by the spirit the interpretation of these dreams. And I know them to be true, especially the one that the Broncos are going to win the, the Super Seattle Bowl. The Seahawks won their first Super Bowl in franchise history Sunday night, beating the Denver Broncos 43 to eight. It really wasn't about those guys. It was our guys, just, we just played the way we always play. From the first snap, things just didn't go Peyton Manning's way. A miscommunication and the ball went in the end zone for a safety, just 12 seconds into the game. Things went downhill from there for Manning. Yeah! Both teams' fans were well represented in the stadium, but in the game's final minutes, it's only half were no pleased. Category in which the Denver Broncos beat Seattle yesterday. Special teams, offense, defense, and the Denver Protecting Broncos. The pass, I'm not gonna lie to you. It's, it, I find it hard to believe how they're gonna be able to walk the streets in the off season. They made themselves look like frauds in one game. Total. The Holy Spirit has bore witness to me that the Broncos will win this Super Bowl. The Holy Spirit has bore witness to me that the Broncos will win this Super Bowl. Thank you.
which is the testimony of Jesus Christ. But they shall stumble in their assumption that the world is any standard, and that its ways are anything but demonic. Well, why did Mr. Taylor presume to use God's gift to predict the Super Bowl's outcome? Well, he tells us. But because sports is so huge to human beings in America, but because sports is so huge to human beings in America, sports is so huge to human beings in America, I believe God is also trying to show them that he knows the forecast of the future in every arena of life. And so to all the football fans out there, to all you football players, Lines flowing freely, the lines flowing freely, the lines flowing freely. The lines. <laughs> so long as repentance and the coming out of Babylon is delayed, so much will Babylon grow increasingly wicked. The sins of Babylon shall mount up to heaven until God cannot withhold his hand from wrath. Not content with the errors of their fathers, younger, brasher, false teachers will arise and show themselves willing to push into new frontiers of blasphemy and apostasy from the gospel. The intoxicating drink of Babylon shall gain strength in its deluding effects, causing vain professors of Christ and the world with them to bring forth something the world heretofore has not.